The gentleman who has appeared on A&E's Comedy on the Road, on Fox TV's Comedy Express, and he's written for Jay Leno's Tonight Show Monologues. Very, very pleased to have him with us tonight. Please welcome, please, Mr. Dylan Brody. while I'm performing. I will not be offended. I like you to be drunk. <laughs> and while you're up there, make sure you tip the miniature bartender. <laughs> A lovely woman who's working there, remember, from Sesame Street and the Muppet Show. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm Dylan Brody. Uh, I will be performing for you later a story I did on the radio called Xenophobia and the Jewish Druid, or Funny You Don't Look Druish. Uh, before I get to that, I have to vent just a little bit. It's been a, a rough month or so uh, for me. I had to go back east uh, for my grandmother's funeral a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, don't. It was not a tragedy. Uh, uh, she, she became nicer as she deteriorated into Alzheimer's. Is that wrong? The last time I saw her alive uh, was just terrifying. Every time I saw her, she thought it was my birthday and gave me five dollars. Exhausting to deal with. I had to keep walking in and out of that room. <laughs> conversation it turned into some surreal <coughs> television game show. Let's play Guess the Topic. So I went into that place with the buildings and the smell Manhattan. Yes! And I was with the, 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 the funny looking woman. My mother, no, flowered dress. Aunt Sarah, no, bad breath, long stories. Your best friend Katie, yes! We were on 43rd Street, we saw that man, he used to be horrible in New York, and then he was horrible all over the country, and now he's horrible from space, Howard Stern, yes! <laughs> Congratulations, Grandma, you're going on to the dementia pyramid. <laughs> Who are you people? Things you say at the dinner table. <laughs> Where am I? Things you say in the kitchen. 1942, 1958, years you think it might be right now. <laughs> Now my, my mother is terrified that she's going to have Alzheimer's, so she pulled me aside while I was back east. She pulled me aside she said, Dylan, you have to promise me the moment I start showing symptoms, you will tell me so that I know when it's time to take my own life. I said, Mom, we just had this conversation 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Settle down, people. I've only got 20 minutes. I don't have time to waste on laughter and applause. <laughs> That was an applause. <laughs> the best any single audience can manage. <laughs> Do you realize how long the show will take if I just have you each applaud individually <laughs> after a different joke? We'll be here till like four in the morning. I saw my father while I was on the East Coast. Uh, my dad is the Associate Provost of the Arts at MIT. Uh, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's, it's not, by the way, pronounced the arts at MIT. Um, it's, it's a perfect job for him, right there at the intersection of art and science. Uh, some of you may have heard about his splendid Heisenberg Uncertainty Opera. No. And, oh, it's an epic musicale during which it's possible to accurately determine either the position or the momentum of the fat lady at any given time. <laughs> They found him for the job when a member of the search committee was in England and caught his Cambridge University production of The Pirates of Penzance starring Stephen Hawking as the Pirate King. <laughs> the singing wasn't great, but the, the choreography was innovative. <laughs> oh, do not gang grown me, I was in England, Professor Hawking himself heard me do that joke and told me I'm a very funny man. Although in fairness, it's impossible to tell when he's being sarcastic. <laughs> God and explain it to the people who didn't. <laughs> and then I'll start up again. <laughs> I guess that was the laughter from the people having it explained. <laughs> I saw my sister while I was there. I went to hear my sister speak at NYU. She was uh, delivering a, a brilliant lecture, actually, on uh, 
on welfare reform. For, apparently for the last 30 years, every significant welfare reform proposal has been based on the concept that the best way to discourage people from being poor is to take away their money. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister takes this very, very personally because she was briefly on, well, I should explain. Uh, my sister is gay. I love her like a brother. <laughs> and, and she was briefly on government assistance. She has a, a, she's a single mom. She has a beautiful, beautiful daughter who was deliberately conceived in a loving act between my sister and a turkey baster that was briefly filled with male her sperm. Uh, just one of the reasons I won't do Thanksgiving dinner at my sister's <laughs> Mom, get that out of the butter. You don't know where it's going. <laughs> we just had this conversation about a minute ago. <laughs> you know, she has this, this, this lovely daughter. She was briefly on government assistance when she was fired. She's not lazy. She's not a slacker. But she was fired from her bartending job uh, for breastfeeding her infant in the back room on a break. At, at an establishment, understand, that proudly displays posters of the Coors Girls. Because we live in this bizarre society where it's okay to use breasts to sell beer but yep. not to feed yeah. children. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I went to hear her speak uh, at NYU. It was neat being back in, in, in the village on the East. The last time I was back in the village, uh, 10, 12 years ago, I was there on Halloween evening. Um, and the, the East Village was sort of the, the, the heart of, of gay central in New York. And let me, just, let me just back up a second. I spent, earlier this week, I had to go to West Hollywood in uh, LA. Uh, for a uh, meeting with a producer who wanted to give me rewrite notes on a screenplay that he had earlier said was perfect. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are not in the in show business, let me explain to you how it works. Uh, producers are very much like dogs. The more they like something, the more they need to pee on it. Yeah. And this producer likes me a lot. So I was going down to, the, the, uh, to West Hollywood to, to be figuratively peed on, um, which is one of the top 10 reasons people go to West Hollywood. <laughs> which is ironic, because literally being peed on is one of the top three. Um, <laughs> I got groaned by Kermit the bartender. Um, so, Oscar the bartender. Uh, Oscar the bartender, okay. Apparently, she's very choosy about which Muppet she likes to be in there. So I'd gotten dressed up to go to this meeting in West Hollywood, and I am neurotically punctual, but I'm also compulsively status conscious. So I like to get places early, but then I don't like to be the first one there. <laughs> so I had gone to this meeting and I was dressed up nicely and I had time to kill. So uh, I, I went into a coffee house to kill some time. Guys, listen to me. <laughs> Men, if you're ever feeling a little down on yourself, a little unattractive, a little bit like you've lost your edge, dress up nicely, drive all the way up to West Hollywood, <laughs> hang out in a coffee house. I was getting checked out like the Kama Sutra at a middle school library. And I am not particularly homophobic, so for me, this was good fun. I'm willing to get my ego stroked, you know, as long as my ego is the only thing getting stroked. Um, I, don't understand, I don't understand homophobia. I don't get it. It makes no sense to me, the whole homophobia thing. It's, it's clearly bigotry, and yet we pretend it's not. The right wing constantly has to sidestep, not to admit what they're talking about, you know? They, they, they're against gay marriage, they can't come out and say, we're not saying these guys can't support a long-term committed relationship. We're just saying, when we think about what they do at home, it makes us go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> they know that's not going to fly in national television, but that's admitting that it's bigotry. So they make up the excuses. Oh, we have to protect the sanctity of marriage. Okay. <laughs> then you don't prevent some people from getting married, you outlaw divorce and unanticipated weight gain. <laughs> <laughs> These are the same people who 20 years ago were saying the problem with homosexuality is at least the promiscuity. I have a theory. I think you can't please bigots. <laughs> Just a theory. It's like there's some group of weird homophobes hanging out in Washington, coming up with reasons to deny people their civil rights, and every, every 10 or 15 years they come up with something that sticks for a minute. Remember? Like 10 years ago, it was all about gays in the military. Oh, can't have gays in the military, no, no. 
We, it, it'll hurt morale if we let gays in the military. No, it won't. All right, look. You find yourself outside the green zone, under heavy fire. Don't you think the guy next to you is more likely to save your life if he's in love with you? <laughs> just so long as it's getting saved. I want to be the most popular guy in the barracks. Candy and flowers for everybody. <laughs> Speaking of gays in the military, Dick Army. Dick Army, representative on the floor of the House of Representatives, referred to homosexual representative Barney Frank as Barney Fag. And then apologized. Oh, it just slipped out. Oh yeah, that happens all the time. You go to the ballpark, you think you're ordering two francs, you wind up with a Brian and a Chad. Ridiculous. <laughs> it just slipped out. Like, that's going to work with any other form of bigotry at this point. Like, Hillary Clinton could have come out during the South Carolina debates there and said, what my esteemed opponent, Barack O'Darkey, fails to mention. <laughs> Did I say that? It just slipped out. No! No, oh, she would have Michael Richards shoved up her imus so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote Michael Richards shoved up her imus in the car on the way down here. That is gold. That is gold, baby. <laughs> yeah, but Dick Army calls Barney Frank Barney Fag in public. People all over the country go, well, yeah, I can see how that would slip out of anyone. <laughs> It's bigotry, and we have to stop accepting it. Oh, I, I, I know why I got off on this. The last time I was in New, in New York, uh, I was there on Halloween night, and I was down in the, in the, uh, the East Village, uh, and I was standing at a crosswalk. And uh, Halloween night in the East Village, it's just a wonderful thing. Everybody's in costume, and there was a lovely couple standing right next to me, a uh, 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 gay leather boy couple. Uh, one of them was wearing uh, combat boots and uh, a, a leather speedo, and, a and uh, the other one was wearing leather chaps and a leather vest and like a leather police hat. Uh, and he was the master. I could tell he was the master because he was holding the other one's leash. Um, and they were standing next to me there, and I found myself thinking, well, that's nice. That proves to me that if you wait long enough and you're patient and you're open, anyone on this planet can find love. I think that's true. I don't think you should settle. I think you should find love. I think there is somebody out there for everybody. That's why men have a fetish for anything. <laughs> I swear to God, for every hunchback, one-legged dwarf with a wart in the middle of her forehead, locked in her apartment, watching Seventh Heaven, there's some guy wandering the streets, cold and lonely at night, going, where is she and why does she hide from me? <laughs> Scouring the internet. Where are the websites for me? And they were standing there, and I was looking at them, and I was thinking, that was kind of nice. And then coming up perpendicular to us, coming up the other way on the street, was another gay young couple that was dressed as sperm. Uh, <laughs> they, they were wearing uh, white leotards and tights and had long toilet paper tails. And they were literally, they were grown men frolicking up the street. And, and in case we couldn't tell what they were, they were singing at the top of their voices, they were singing sperm, glorious sperm, as they went by. And as they went past, the leather slave boy turned to his master and said, Freaks. <laughs> and it occurred to me that we live in this great society where if you wait long enough and you're open enough, anybody can find somebody else to judge harshly. <laughs> um, I promised, I, I made a promise that I would tell the story of xenophobia and the Jewish druid this evening. Uh, I hope I've worked out the time about right so that, that we come out dead on. If I go long, just forgive me. Um, I have to preface the story by explaining that uh, I was raised Jewish, but badly. Um, <laughs> my, my parents were lax Jews. They wanted to raise me with a sense of history and tradition, but they didn't really know what they were doing. So like, every year they wanted to celebrate Hanukkah, they never really knew what day it started. <laughs> they were just burning extra candles, trying to make up lost time. <laughs> my dad didn't really know the Hebrew, you know, so every night he was lighting up the menorah, making it up as he went along, going, uh, abracadabra, alakazam, <laughs> we light the candles, we don't eat ham. <laughs> My eighth day is just getting ridiculous. We will not eat it in a boat, we will not eat it with a goat, we will not eat the Gentile's ham, we will not eat it lechayem. <laughs> um, so I was raised Jewish. Uh, 
but I'm not really I'm a practicing Jew. I, I, as a martial artist, I've studied some Buddhism. Uh, I was a practicing Druid for a time. Uh, and now I'm really an atheist who's into astrophysics. I'm, I'm essential, essentially a, a Jewish Zen pagan with a newish yen for Sagan. Um, <laughs> you see how I just marched you all the way to that joke? That was more marching than any simple joke deserves, ladies and gentlemen. And all of this makes my father-in-law crazy because he is a Southern Baptist Evangelical minister. <laughs> the story kind of really believes the stuff, not the kind that's in it for the money that I can understand. And two weeks before my wedding, he sent my lovely bride a letter saying that she should not marry me because we would not be on equal footing and couldn't spend eternity together in heaven. As if till death do us part was not intimidating enough. <laughs> I parenthetically, let me tell you that I took revenge on him at the rehearsal dinner. I kept bringing up Jesus stuff and deliberately getting it wrong. I told him I told him I had always admired Jesus for his immortality and his ability to turn into a bat when threatened. You know, that's Dracula you're thinking of, Dylan. Yeah, there was something about drinking blood in there, wasn't there? Man! This went from we love you to now we judge the comic. Just like that. <laughs> xenophobia and the Jewish Druid. F xenophobia, so you will know, is fear of that which is different. It is not a fear of warrior princesses. <laughs> the people go, xenophobia and the Jewish Druid are funny, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> it's okay, I liked it. <laughs> Our penis, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> In 1992, when I was still a practicing druid, Halloween evening, I realized that I should be doing something to mark the occasion. It's an important holiday for pagans. So I drove to a park near my home where I had sanctified a small grove for my ritual uses. And I parked my car across the street from the grove, and I got out of my car, and a homeless man approached me coming down the street with a ghost mask pushed up on his head and a big bag of candy. And he smiled and gave me a big thumbs up. And I smiled and gave him a big thumbs up because Halloween is the one night of the year in this country when a homeless guy can feel like a participant. He said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I began to cross the street to my sacred grove. And I was aware of the homeless guy crossing the street just behind me. And I reminded myself that I was entering a sacred space. Nothing could harm me here. I was perfectly safe. And I entered my grove, and the homeless guy sat down at the base of one of the trees to eat his candy dinner. And I moved from the tree, from tree to tree, putting my hands against them. And this is pretty much how I practiced when I was a druid. I put my hands on the trees and asked them for wisdom, and they would stand there because they're trees. <laughs> and as I'm moving from tree to tree, I'm standing under one tree there with, with my hands on the thing, and I realize that I'm completely lost in shadow as a, a group of five or six young Hispanic men come into the park. And I realized that, you know, demographically speaking, uh, thanks to the fear-mongering of, of Fox News and, and MSNBC, these are the people I am most supposed to fear as it's nearing midnight in a park, and I'm a middle-class white guy. And I remind myself that I am in a sacred space, nothing can harm me. I am perfectly safe. And they stop about six feet away from me, totally unaware of my presence, and they're drinking the beer, and they're speaking fast Spanish and I'm eavesdropping on them. I feel like a spy, but I don't speak Spanish, so I feel like a bad spy. <laughs> and I don't want to be eavesdropping. I don't want to be invading their space any more than I want them invading my space. So I stepped away from the tree and I said, excuse me, and they went, ah! <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I'm a druid. I'm using this grove right now. Could you come back in 10 or 15 minutes while I'm through? <laughs> <laughs> and they whispered to each other in fast Spanish, and then they spread out into sort of a loose semicircle. And one of them stepped forward in what may or may not have been a slightly threatening tone. He said to me, Excuse me? <laughs> and at this point, I had a vivid, detailed, terrifying memory of the world's stupidest mugging, of which I had been a victim some 20 years earlier. I was in New York City as a young man. 21 years old, 
I was farther north on the island of Manhattan than any middle class white guy has any right to be, as it's nearing midnight. It was January, it was very cold. I was sitting waiting for a bus, my breath steaming in the night air. And a large African American man came out of the building behind me and sat down, to, well it was, it was still the early 80s, so it was still a big black guy. <laughs> came out of the building behind me and sat down next to me. And we sat together waiting for the bus with our breath steaming in the night air. And it looked for a moment like he wanted to say something, but he didn't know how to say it, and I figured I could encourage him, so I said, are you okay, sir? And he said, give me all your money. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, I'm mugging you. Give me all your money. And I said, well, do you have a knife or something? <laughs> And he said, if you want, I could go in and get a knife. <laughs> I didn't want that. So I gave him six dollars, which was all the money I had in my pocket when I was 21. And then we sat together with our breath, steaming in the night air, waiting for the bus, until I realized there was a problem. And I said, well, now I can't get on the bus. And he said, sorry, and handed back a dollar. <laughs> Which was, at the time, the gone bus ride. And I it and said, thank you. <laughs> and we sat together with our breaths <laughs> until the bus came. And I got on, and I paid my dollar, and he was getting on behind me to pay. And I thought about you know, saying, hey, this guy just mugged me. But now it's $5, so it felt less like reporting a crime than telling on a guy. <laughs> so I just got on the bus and sat down, and he got on behind me, and sat down a few rows back, and after a few blocks, he tapped me on the shoulder, and I said, what? And he held out $2, and said, why don't you take half of this money back? You really always ought to have some cash on you. <laughs> and I took the $2, and again, I said, thank you. <laughs> to my mother, and we rode on toward downtown, and after a few more blocks, he rang the bell to signal the bus driver that he wanted to get off the bus, and as we were pulling over, he tapped me on the shoulder again, I said, what? And he held out the last two dollars and said, you know, I, I really just needed bus fare. And it occurred to me for the first time that we live in this bizarre society where it's less humiliating to be a criminal than a little short on cash. <laughs> but by now I felt like I had bonded with my mother. <laughs> so I pushed it back into his hand and I said, why don't you hang on to that? You really always ought to have some cash on you. <laughs> and he said, thank you. <laughs> I kept the two dollars and got up. And apparently the bus driver caught the tail end of this conversation because we pulled away from the curb again. He looked back in the rearview mirror and he said, you know, you really shouldn't give them poor people money. It only encourages them. <laughs> now, all of this flashed through my mind as I'm standing in this park at midnight with the moonlight filtering down through the trees and this group of young Hispanic men fanned out around me with their long neck bottles of beer and this one has just stepped forward in a tone that may or may not have been threatening. He said, excuse me? <laughs> what did you just say to me? And I was trying desperately to formulate an answer that would be non-aggressive, non-confrontational, be friendly, and, and the homeless guy stood up behind them and said, he said, and they went, ah! <laughs> and the homeless man said, he said, we're druids. We're using this grove right now. Could you come back in 10 or 15 minutes when we're through? <laughs> And the guys all sort of huddled together and spoke fast Spanish. And the leader turned back toward me and said, So, what, like 1215, 12.30? <laughs> and I said, That'd be great, thank you. And they moved on away from the grove. And I gave the homeless guy a big thumbs up and a smile. And he gave me a thumbs up and a smile because he'd been a participant instead of a pest. And he sat back down to finish his candy dinner. And I went back to greeting my tree. And apparently the shadows had entirely swallowed me back up again. Because as they were walking away, one of the guys turned back around and looked and then said to his friends, Yo, 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 dudes! Where did they go? And how many do you think there were? <laughs>